All right, welcome everyone to Plant-Based Kidney Health. And I can't believe, is this really our episode number four? It's already episode number four. Wow. Well, guys, thank you so much. I, I, I have to tell you, I mean, this is so amazing. We're getting so much feedback from people. We've been getting questions after each episode. So what we try to do on this show really, guys, is we are focused on trying to answer all of your questions. So as you hear us, send your questions in. Our email is plantbasedkidneyhealth at gmail.com. If you don't know who we are, I'm Sean Hashmi. I'm a board certified nephrologist and obesity medicine specialist. And this is my partner, Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Krosmer, and I'm a registered dietitian and certified specialist in renal nutrition. So, Michelle, where, where do you want to start today? What questions did we get this time? Okay, so I think um, the first one of the first ones that we have on the list for today is um, definitely for you. But the person asked, at what GFR should someone have a fistula placed or a permanent access placed for yeah. dialysis? This is a really important question, guys, and I'll tell you why it's so critical. The reason that this makes such a big difference is because imagine, if you will, you have four lifelines, PD being the fifth one, but let's let's put PD out of it for a second and just talk about hemo or blood dialysis. You have four lifelines, two right up here, which is your neck area, and two, which is your groin area. If you lose those four access, then we basically have no way to be able to dialyze you. Now, what does that have to do with fistula placement? Fistulas, they need time to mature. So if you're somebody who is well controlled in all your numbers, your fistula may mature very, very well in anywhere between six weeks to eight weeks, sometimes longer. But some people can take three months to six months for the fistula to get ready. Some people need revision surgery. So in general, what we have done is my rule is what I call the 15-20-25 rule or the 25-20-15 rule. Basically, what it means is if your kidney function is at 25 of a GFR number, we jokingly say percent, but it's not really percent, but just think of it in that regard. So when you're at around 25 percent, what we want to do is the nephrologists, our dietitians, and our social workers, all of us, we want to educate you on dialysis. We want you to know what your options are, what transplant means, all of that. And the reason for that is, is because there's a little bit of shell shock. People think dialysis is very scary and we need to get them over that and we need to guide them through it. So it takes time. When they get below 20, we say it's time to get ready. And that means putting the fistula in if they're going the route of hemodialysis. Because what we don't know is how long it will take you to get ready. If you have substantial amount of protein you're spilling in the urine, you may decline very, very fast. So once you're less than 20, it's time. Then when you get to less than 15, we say you're in dialysis territory. Where you start dialysis is a joint decision between your nephrologist and you. It could be because at less than 15, you have so much swelling, we can't control it, that dialysis is the best option. Or it may be that you get below 10, you have no symptoms, you're doing really, really well, we don't have to start it. We sometimes make a a compromise where we start patients on sort of a modified dialysis regimen. Instead of three days a week, we do two days a week so that they can get dialysis yet at the same time. They don't have to f have the full burden of it. So that's a long-winded answer to essentially say is when you get less than 20, it's really around the time we want to put in a fistula for you. And so my question for you is with that, I think a lot of times people, what I've heard, heard people say is that they think the fistula is placed and it's this, okay, and when it matures, you're automatically starting dialysis. So can someone have a fistula placed as like, okay, we, we want to prevent emergency dialysis from an emergency access from being needed, but can someone have a fistula placed and potentially not need it for months to years, depending on their state that they're in and symptoms and all of that. Absolutely. And in fact, I've seen that happen. I've had some patients where we put a fistula in, but they've taken such control of their lives. They've done everything that we talk about on this channel. They're sleeping, they're moving more, they're working on reducing the stress, and they're eating a plant-based diet that's whole food, not just processed foods. So as a result, 
their A1Cs are better, their blood pressures are better, they're maintaining a healthy weight. And so all of those things together slow down the decline. And even though we put in a fistula, they haven't needed it. So the fistulas can stay in. And if you don't use them, that's fine. Every once in a while, it turns out, especially people who've had kidney transplants, where the fistula, you know, you can hear the sound sometimes when it grows really big, and we can tie that off. But bottom line there is, is you don't want to delay the fistula because if you end up getting catheters, they can cause scarring, they can cause stenosis. And remember, they're going in your four lifelines. If you lose those four lifelines, we don't have anything left. And this is why we make such a big deal about making sure that we do optimal starts or get the access in in a timely fashion. Yeah. And I love that you say that because it's it's not necessarily that it's this like sentence to, you know, to dialysis or to something. It's it's really to protect you and prevent you from needing that emergency catheter access and or using one of those lifelines. And you can have the fistula placed and not need it if you're at that um, lower GFR. But, and I, you know, like you've seen, I, I have a current client I've been working with over a year, maybe close to a year and a half now that had a fistula placed at the beginning of us working together and, you know, her GFR is stable. She doesn't have any symptoms, potassium's controlled and she feels good. And it's there if she needs it, if, and when she needs it. But for now she's thriving, you know, not on dialysis. So everyone's case is different, but I think it's important, um, to hear you explain that as far as when someone might need to have that placed. And it's kind of like insurance. You don't get insurance because you know your house is going to burn down. You're getting insurance in case something happens to the house. Right. You know you're covered. In an emergency situation, if you see the trend of the kidneys getting worse, the fistula is there so we can start you. And the other reason why it's such a big deal, if we have to put a catheter, usually we have to admit you to the hospital. If we can just go ahead and start outpatient with the fistula, we save you a hospitalization, we save you a lot of stress and mental anguish as you go through this. Yep. All right, let's change topics. Now, this was a question that we received, and it's a question that I get asked a lot, and I always defer to our exceptional dietitians, but now I have you, so I don't need to ask anybody else. So here's my question. <laughs> what vitamins and supplements should someone with kidney disease take? Okay. So I also get asked this all the time and I wish it was a very simple, easy, straightforward answer, but of course it's not. Um, the thing with vitamins and supplements that is important with kidney disease and kidney health is, you know, we need to be cautious. Um, <clears throat> you know, our kidneys are filtering our blood, removing waste and toxins. And for some vitamins and minerals, you know, they play a role in preventing, um, you know, toxic levels of vitamins in our blood. And so it's what it ultimately comes down to is, and what I recommend is that we don't want to be over supplementing. We want to supplement things that we either are deficient in. I, you know, that blood work has told us we're low in or deficient in or supplements that we simply cannot get enough in our diet or supplements that um, are not harmful to the kidneys and that might be helping us in some way. And so when we think of it in that sense, and I like to give some examples of things, but vitamin D is a, you know, that's a vitamin that the general population, it's more common to be deficient in and especially in the kidney disease population. But even knowing that it's still important to have your blood levels checked so that your physician and renal dietitian can recommend a dose. You know, do you need a higher dose for a short period of time or do you need a lower maintenance dose that you take on a daily basis? And so it's important to still individualize that and know how your blood um, looks. And then there is, you know, other things that we know, like, for example, vitamin C, high doses of vitamin C supplementation, especially taken on a daily basis, is not good for people with kidney disease. It can even increase the risk of developing kidney stones. And so that's something where, you know, vitamin C is something that is in a lot of supplements or supplement blends and oftentimes in very high amounts. And so that's where it becomes really tricky. So um, usually what I say with that is, Across the board, we, if we can get it from food, then that is going to be the best because it's usually in amounts that our body can tolerate and our kidneys can handle. And then we supplement things that we're deficient in or that we, you know, can't get enough in the diet. So 
I know that's kind of a roundabout answer with that, but I think, and again, some of the more common ones would be, again, vitamin D is more common to be low in someone with kidney disease. Um, vitamin B12 needs to be supplemented in someone who is on a plant-based diet or a vegetarian or vegan diet. And so that's something to keep in mind. And then there are kidney specific vitamins. So they're called like renal vitamins and Usually those are going to contain B vitamins that people might have lower levels of when they have kidney disease and a very small amount, usually only about 60 to 90 milligrams of vitamin C to make sure that you get the adequate amount in the diet, but not getting this really high excessive amount. So those are always an option. Otherwise it would be doing things, you know, kind of supplementing what you need on its own instead of just doing you know, so I usually don't recommend that people with kidney disease just take a standard over-the-counter multivitamin, especially if you're in later stages of kidney disease. No, I, I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, when it comes to especially vitamins like B vitamins, you know, when we're doing dialysis on patients, that becomes really, really important. But prior to that, we really emphasize foods. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about potassium. So as a result, people are afraid of fruits, people are afraid of vegetables. And I, we've talked about this on previous episodes. We are able as nephrologists, as dietitians, and essentially as healthcare providers to help you control your potassium. This is not where you would rather put down the strawberries and go have the hamburger. What we're saying is, is if you are having an issue with fruits, let us help you. If it's vegetables, let us help you. And, and keeping that in mind that the best source of all of these vitamins really is food. Yep, exactly. And the thing too that is important to think about is, you know, we know about certain vitamins and minerals um, because we've studied populations of people who consume diets that are usually higher in this. And so some of these, you know, miracle things like, you know, taking turmeric supplements or ginger supplements. And, you know, we know that those are anti-inflammatory, high antioxidant, um, you know, vitamins and supplements because we've we found in populations of people that consume them regularly that, you know, it's beneficial. And then what we like to do is just concentrate it, put it in this really high dose pill form and say, take this where now, you know, well, what was that spice used on? What type of food was that spice used in? And that's likely where that center, again, that synergistic effect of food and vitamins and minerals all work together. Versus if you change absolutely nothing with your diet and you just start taking a supplement, well, that's, it's, you're not going to see the same effect as if you, you know, change up your diet and add more whole plant foods and potentially use some of these spices instead of yep. just taking them in supplement or capsule forms, which again, can potentially be in very, very high quantities that potentially could be dangerous. You know, there's a big difference there. So I usually recommend that people be cautious um, if you have kidney disease with um, overdoing vitamins and supplements and ideally, you know, talk with your renal dietitian or your doctor about what you actually need or what might, you know, benefit you or help you versus just taking things across the board, especially if you just, you know, read it in a forum or, or online. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. What's our next question? Okay. So next, and this is actually a good segue, um, because it's about a, you know, a specific mineral, but, mm. um, we were asked, someone was asking specifically about calcium and, you know, about calcium mm. supplements, taking calcium supplements. But I think it's important, especially with calcium. If we, if you can explain just the, the, the role of calcium supplements potentially on kidney health or heart health. And if that's something that people should or shouldn't be taking. Oh gosh, you know, calcium is probably one of the most controversial topics to address. And it's, it's funny because even if we go back and we look at the very, very first data that we had around calcium in terms of how the recommendations came out, it turned out that they had a really small study. It was less than a hundred people that they tested it on. And what they figured out was what was essentially a neutral calcium balance. What that meant is the amount you took calcium in and the amount that left the body, and this is in healthy people. And so they figured that's how much calcium you needed to be eating. But that data had nothing to do with does that amount of calcium impact fracture risk and all sorts of other outcomes. So there was nothing studied on outcomes. So I've always been weary about these recommendations on calcium because the original data that they based it on 
was only looking at a neutral balance. Now let's get into kidney disease. So what's interesting is, is if you look at the National Kidney Foundation, what they basically say is, is that the total calcium intake, that means food plus supplements in people with renal disease, really should not be greater than 2,000 milligrams per day. That's the total. Now, what's the evidence? Well, there was a really elegant study that was done, and essentially they were looking at two arms. The first arm was going to be 800 milligrams of calcium per day, and then the other one was going to be 2,000 and more. So when they gave these people 800 milligrams, they found that essentially their calcium balance was negative to neutral. What that meant was that the amount of calcium coming out of their body was essentially more than what was going in. So the idea is, is that you want to balance out the calcium needs. So your bones take in the calcium, all the other places where calcium is needed gets taken up, and then what's left over gets filtered out. That's considered neutral. So at 800, this was total. At 800 total, it looked like it was negative to getting close to neutral. But when they put in 2,000, something very interesting happened. So they put in 2,000, then they measured what was going on in the stool. And they found that, you know, the amount that was going on inside the stool going on, it actually didn't change at all. Okay, so then that means that that 2,000 was getting absorbed. Well, fine. But we already knew that they didn't really need that 2,000. So we expected some of that 2,000 to come out into the urine. They checked the urine. No increase going on in the urine either. Then if that's the case and you put extra calcium in your body, you expect your blood level calcium to rise. If it didn't come out in the stool, it didn't come out in the urine, it should be in the blood. So they checked the blood level, it didn't rise. So here's the million dollar question. Where did the calcium go? And the answer for everybody who's listening or watching is, is it went inside the tissues. So what happens with calcium is, is as you take more than what your body needs, it will precipitate out, which means it will combine with things like phosphorus. And this is why in dialysis patients, sometimes when we do x-rays, like a chest x-ray, you can literally see every single one of their blood vessels on the chest x-ray. It's lighting up so much because of the fact that they have such bad calcifications going on. So somewhere between the 800 mark and the 2000 mark lies the truth. You know, with NKF, what the recommendation is to stay under 2000. So in terms of trying to supplement, I don't think patients on kidney disease need to supplement calcium. There's lots of good sources. You know, it's interesting when we talk about things like kidney stones, what do we tell people is to eat a diet rich in calcium, not to take calcium supplements because the diet rich in calcium, the calcium in food will go in their gut and will bind the oxalate and prevent the oxalate from entering inside their body. So it's paradoxical in that you get calcium oxalate stones as the number one thing to prevent calcium oxalate stones. We want you to increase calcium in your diet. So here, when we talk about kidney disease, what we know is, is that if you start taking supplements, that calcium has to go somewhere. And if it ends up in your tissues and gets calcified, one of the markers for early death is how flexible your blood vessels are. The less flexible, the harder they become, meaning they're all calcified and hardened, the more likely you are to see issues with your blood pressure, you are to have all these complications. One of the things that we see in patients that are all the way at the end stages of kidney disease is they have a very large difference between their systolic blood pressure and their diastolic blood pressure. So what that means is, is their vessels have gotten stiff and it can't expand and contract anymore. And that's a marker for early death. So bottom line here, is this when it comes to calcium and kidney disease, more is definitely not better. We still think going with food is still one of the best things going on. So yep, that explains a lot. And I have a follow-up question to that. Yeah. So then let's say someone is taking or not taking a calcium supplement, or they're looking just simply at how many milligrams they're consuming in their diet. Um, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but ultimately how would their blood, like, could their blood work, calcium blood levels still be within a normal range and they could still be consuming or supplementing too much calcium in the diet where that calcification is going on? Absolutely. And and this is why this study that I was talking about, it was done in 2014 with Spiegel and colleagues. The reason it was so 
important and so elucidating is is calcium in your blood is being regulated by your bones it's being regulated by your kidneys it's being regulated by the absorption of calcium in the gut so your serum levels won't necessarily rise that extra calcium will go somewhere and if the kidneys can't handle it there's only one place left and that's going into your tissues so in other words if you're consuming too much calcium it's going to end up somewhere and you want to be aware of that. And this is why just because something is good, too much of it doesn't mean it's great. Yep, exactly. And the person who had asked this question, you know, they were, and this is an important thing to remember too with calcium, is they were asking almost specifically about Tums. And so that's something to keep in mind too, is that these, sometimes these antacids or these uh, medications, over-the-counter meds that someone might be taking for heartburn, um, you know, those are calcium-based and they're providing calcium. And so that is something to keep in mind is that if that, that does count as supplemental calcium and is adding to your diet. So you want to be mindful of, of that, um, and talk about, you know, what you're taking with, with your doctor and again, with your renal dietitian. So. Excellent. Well, let me ask you then, since, since we're on the subject of calcium supplements and, you know, just calcium in general, how, how much calcium can be absorbed at once? So typically it's, you know, less, you want it to be less than 600 milligrams. Um, so usually they, what they'll say is about 500 milligrams of the calcium can be absorbed at one time. So if someone is, if someone does need calcium supplementation and they need, let's say a thousand milligrams, then splitting that up, uh, maybe into 250 or even 500, you know, let's say it's 500 milligrams in the morning and the evening. But the other thing that's important with calcium is that calcium can, um, and taking calcium supplements can reduce or inhibit the absorption of some other minerals, um, and specifically things like iron. And so, you know, usually with kidney disease, anemia is something, and we are trying to increase the absorption of iron. And so if someone is taking those, a calcium supplement, than ideally taking it, you know, away from their iron rich meal so that they're not reducing or inhibiting the absorption of iron. No, I, I think that's, that's really, really helpful and important to understand. So if, if let's say that I'm trying to plan out my day in terms of taking calcium, what would be some tips in terms of how to space it out and kind of think about it in those terms? Um, so I think kind of with everything else is it's best, it is best spaced out. Um, you know, this comes into play even with things like potassium. We don't want this bank of protein or potassium or calcium where we just save it all up for one giant meal of the day. Um, because that's really, you know, our, our bodies and our kidneys are meant to, to utilize food and nutrients throughout the day. So I think it's best, you know, calcium and everything else is spreading out throughout the day, whether that's two or three meals plus one or two snacks, then that's going to be the best the best way to do that. And, you know, our, uh, some plant sources of the calcium, you know, our leafy greens are going to be great sources of calcium, um, certain beans and legumes, and then sometimes like fortified foods might have, you know, calcium added to them. But ultimately, again, it's spreading it out throughout the day. You don't want it to be, okay, well, I'm going to have this one super high calcium meal or super high potassium meal, but then not eat anything else the rest of the day. We really want it to be spread out. And again, that could be different from person to person in general, two to three meals, one to two snacks, depending on your, your lifestyle and what, what fits into your day of eating. I, I love that. I love that. So, so that's really practical advice as far as calcium is concerned. All right. So, so coming back and trying to sum up some of the main points for today, at least from my perspective, what I hope that you know, the folks listening to this will get out of this is when it comes to calcium supplementation, don't get caught up in the hype. Same thing with, you know, vitamins and everything else that we talk about is, at least from my perspective, you don't want to get caught up in that more is necessarily better, right? There is an optimal range where too little may be bad for you, but the same way is too much may be bad. So I think that was really important for me to make sure our, our readers and listeners kind of get that. What would you say are some of your take homes? Um, I think aside from that, that's important is what you had talked about earlier with the, with the fistula and with, and with dialysis is, is looking, looking at if your doctor is addressing or even bringing up dialysis to you, it's, it's looking at it through the lens of they're not trying to force you into dialysis. Or I think a lot of times people think they just like, oh, I just want to put you on dialysis. It's easier to manage you, you know, that way. And it's, it's really just, it's to 
give you options and to protect you from having this emergency situation where you have to use one of those lifelines. And it doesn't mean that it's this, you know, definite sentence of being on dialysis. I think that's the thing too. And we could probably have other episodes is, you know, dialysis is, it's a life sustaining treatment, right? And it's needed for some people. It's not needed for other, but that's where that power of food and lifestyle and, you know, comes in is that regardless of what stage of kidney disease you're at, whether you're on dialysis or you're not, or you're like close and your doctor's talking about it with you, you can make changes to your diet and to your lifestyle that help your kidneys, but also protect your heart, prevent cardiovascular outcomes. And so there's always at any stage, there's things that you can be doing. And there is hope at any stage that, um, you know, that you can make a difference. And I think that's, you know, we probably talk about that almost in every episode as well, Mm -hmm. but I think it's so important because it's, it's easy for us to just look at one thing and one route, but we really do have options. And it's just important to talk with your doctor and dietitian and your other healthcare providers about what those options are, but make sure that you're still, like you said, have that insurance policy or that you're being safe and you're, you know, you're aware of all of the potential options or outcomes. Wow. That's, that's excellent. That's excellent. Well, guys, I want to, I want to thank every single person for checking us out. You know, we would love to have your questions. We are really curious to see what questions you guys have. And, you know, both Michelle and I, what we're trying to do is make this so that this really helps you guys out. This is about you guys getting healthier, about you being able to have good conversations with your doctors, being able to go home and make better choices about what you eat. So we're very grateful. Michelle, I, I got to tell you, I mean, this our, our little podcast slash YouTube thing, this is really amazing. The feedback we're getting has been just wonderful. Yeah, I agree. I've even had other renal dietitians reach out and say, you know, I'm, oh, I'm, you know, showing my, my patients this, or I'm telling my colleagues about this because again, and I said this in the first episode, I think it's something that's really been lacking in the kidney community and the oppor- the opportunity for people to ask questions and then get, you know, both the nutrition side and the medical side and just have a discussion around things and explain things in a way where, again, if you have, you know, if you don't have a lot of time at your doctor's office or even with your dietitian, at least hopefully we can explain things um, a little bit longer and more drawn out or in more detail. That way it prompts you to ask those questions of, okay, well, is this, how do I make this relevant or specific to me when you do go back to, to your doctor? I, I, I couldn't agree more. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for checking out another episodes and we look forward to your questions. And uh, other than that, then I think we will see you guys next week. Yeah, we'll see you guys next week. And you can submit your questions, um, plantbasedkidneyhealth at gmail.com, and we'll answer them on future episodes. Perfect. And that's plantbasedkidneyhealth at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody. Take care of yourselves. You got this one body, right? And don't forget, as long as you're taking care of yourself, one other thing you can also do is express gratitude and be kind to others. This is a small world. We have just a short amount of time in this world, and being kind to others is goes really, really a long ways. So with that, thanks, everybody. See you guys next time. See you guys next week.